Thanks for joining us today at City Life. We believe today's message will empower you and point you towards Jesus. But remember that church is so much more than a message you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life, in person or online. series, Hungry, Hungry Humans, and today I want to talk about restlessness. How many of you have been feeling restless lately? Like you can just, you can just feel, you can see it in the eyes of people as you just realize, especially once the, the announcement came that like the restrictions are going away. <clears throat> yes, you can cheer. And it, it just, it just Let's see, it, it just kind of stirred up that, oh, I can't wait to burn my mask. <laughs> there w- that will be a thing, I guarantee it. There will be mask burning parties. And, <laughs> and my wife says they will be here. Not literally right here, but out there. In the parking lot. I'll bring the gas. And, uh, you know, we've, we've all been restless. We've been restless to get back to community. We've been restless for connection. We've been restless to just get back to normal. And today I want to talk about a restlessness that's deeper than that. It's a restlessness of the heart, a restlessness of the soul that uh, we, all, we, all cha- we all get challenged with from time to time. And it's a, it's a restlessness that persists even when we're trying to rest they're just, have you, do you ever have those moments where you're trying to rest and you're just laying there in bed and it's like, I want to sleep, but my mind does not. It's just that restlessness that, that sets in. As I've discovered that as I age, that happens more and more frequently that my body says at 3.30 in the morning, hey, it's time to get up. Let's go do something. Or my body says, let's keep sleeping. My brain says, no, I'm done with that. Enough, enough laying around. Let's, let's go. And uh, I want to encourage us from the book of Deuteronomy. And it's uh, chap- you find this in chapter 32 of the book of De- Deuteronomy. It says, just as an eagle stirs up its nest, encouraging its young to fly, and then hovers over them in case they need help, and spreads its wings and catches them if they fall, and carries them up high on its wings, so the eternal guided Jacob through the wilderness without the help of any foreign god. And, uh, you know, this is such a great passage of how God watches over us. You know, it, it compares, it's Father's Day, and I'm comparing God to a mother eagle. But this is, <laughs> but this, there's, there's actually some really profound things that, that, this, that this reveals to us in, if we look at uh, how an eagle treats its young. And at first, the, when the eaglet is born, the eagle is, it, it's born, it's in this wonderful nest. I don't know if you've seen eagles' nests. Some of them get very large. I think that one of the biggest in the world is like eight feet across or something. Like they get massive. But when the, when the, when the eaglets are born, the, the mother actually takes and covers the nest with all sorts of of soft and warm padded material. And so when the, when the eaglet is born, it's born into this wonderful, soft, warm, comfortable environment. And the mother eagle provides all that the baby needs. All th- this eaglet doesn't have to do anything. All it has to do is just kind of wake up and the, and the mother comes and, and she, she feeds the, eagle, the, the little eaglet. And, and, and like the eaglet, it's, it's enjoying life. It's living large. It's soft, down, comforter, and just being fed all the time. And it doesn't have to do anything doesn't really have to do anything for its own survival. But then what happens is the, as the, this eaglet grows, the mother starts to, to do this thing, starts to remove the padding out of the nest and starts to slowly remove the, the feathers, starts to slowly remove the padding. Pretty soon, the young eagle starts to get uncomfortable. 
And the young eagle where once it's like this, like this bed used to be comfortable. And now it's got like a pokey thing in my back. And uh, the, it's, it's not as satisfying. And, you know, that eagle could start to think, hey, what's wrong with my home? What's wrong with my nest? What's wrong with my mom? Like, what's her problem? I don't get all the comfort that home used to give me. And it, as, this, as the mother continues to remove this padding, as, as the mother continues to remove all the warm, fuzzy material surrounding this baby eaglet, the eaglet gets really uncomfortable. And eventually, she makes it so uncomfortable that the eaglet just keeps working its way until it's, it's standing on the side of the nest. And it's the only place it can, it can get comfortable is just to stand on the side of the nest. And then this remarkable thing happens. The mother eagle swoops in and hits <laughs> the eaglet <laughs> and knocks it out of the nest. <laughs> and some of you may say, that's me. This is, this, is, this is my life right now. I have been struck. I have been knocked out of the nest. And the... This is, how, this is how the eagles, this is how the young eagles learn to fly. At first, they, they flap their wings around the nest. As they're moving around the nest, they start to flap their wings. And then as they, as they get on the edge, and then when they're knocked off, they take their first flights, which is usually not far. It's usually like, basically, they get knocked off, they panic, they flap their wings and make it to the first branch they can find and be safe. But there's actually a term for this flight. It's called fledging. And it's the, it's our fledgling. And it's the, it's the first flights that, it's the first flights that these eaglets ever take. And, and there, there's, have you ever felt like in life you're fledgling? Like, it's just like, I don't feel confident or comfortable or, or even enjoy what's going on. And this is how God, this is how Deuteronomy described Describe God's relationship with Jacob. And, and we can, by inferring that it's to Jacob, it's to the house of faith. It's to our lives. This is a message. This is a message that God watches over you like the mother eagle watches over her young. And from learning the lesson from this, we understand that sometimes the mother eagle doesn't make it comfortable for her young. In fact, she wants... She wants that young eaglet to be uncomfortable. She wants that young eaglet to get restless. And if you, if you leave the nest padded all the time, all that young eaglet will do is sit and, and enjoy the padding of the nest. She has to make it so it's uncomfortable for the young eaglet so that that young eaglet can actually do what it was born to do. And so, see, maybe you've been going through this last season thinking, like, what's wrong with my nest? What's wrong with my relationship with God? How come I don't get the comfort and warm fuzzies like I once did? We all feel like that, don't we? We all go through seasons where we start asking, well, what's wrong? Maybe, maybe the nest is broken. Maybe the nest is defective. Maybe the, maybe the nest doesn't understand that I need to be comfortable in the nest. But maybe the nest isn't the long-term purpose of what God has for our lives. Why aren't I comforted? The, the eaglet could start asking, how, how come my mother doesn't care about me anymore? How come I'm not being fed like I was once fed? And the restlessness and the questioning begins. Maybe that young eaglet starts comparing nests with other young eaglets. How is your nest? (laughs) Is your nest soft and comfortable? How does your mother feed you in your nest? This is a little metaphor. Yeah, we, you get broccoli in our nest. <laughs> Listen to last week's message to understand that. 
you know, my mother used to feed me better, but now I, I think I like your mother better. I'm going to come over to your nest. And, and what about all these pokey sticks that are emerging? Obviously, she doesn't care about us like she once did. Otherwise, she would seek to eliminate the pokey sticks. Restlessness sets in. And we, the real question is, is what is the purpose of this restlessness? And what's the solution? Is it just going and looking for a more comfortable nest? Is it, is it holding a meeting with the other eaglets and taking a vote on mothering policies? <laughs> I think when we, when it comes down to it, there's hunger in our lives that make us restless. And the the question is, is what is the purpose that that hunger is to serve in our lives? Where is that hunger supposed to be directing us? Or where is that restlessness? What is the goal of that restlessness? And so I want to talk, how do we find purpose when we're feeling restless? And I think the best place is we start asking some questions. And the first question, it's a great question, is God trying to get my attention through discomfort? Is God trying to get my attention through discomfort? discomfort. Because let's get honest, some of us don't change until, we're, until life is, gets to a place where it's too uncomfortable not to change. Like some of us, Enneagram 9s, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, we like our comfort. And we will just stay in that track until it's not comfortable anymore. And this, this is definitely, you know, I, I will change when I have to. I'll just, like, like this, this, this car is still moving two miles an hour. I don't need to replace it yet. Is God trying to get my attention through discomfort? What, what is God possibly stirring up in the nice, comfortable nest of our life? See, God, God wants us to grow up. When you look at your kids, you know, we love our kids and we love, you know, we, we love the new grandbaby Gray and he is, he is fun and he, but there's, you want your, you still want them to grow up. You want to, well, mostly want them to grow up, right? There's a part of you that's just like, oh, you could just stay cute and mushy forever. But you do want your children to grow up. You want them, you want to see the signs of growth in their life. God allows us to get uncomfortable be, and, and, and causes us to grow restless because restlessness is one of the things that causes us to grow. And the purpose of discomfort and restlessness is not to make the eaglet unhappy. It's actually because, it's because the nest is not actually what the eagle was born for. The eagle was born to, for a greater purpose than just enjoying the comfort of a warm nest. And in our lives, there's, there's areas where we've, we've enjoyed, you know, in our relationship with God, there's, there's, there's moments that are warm and they're fuzzy and they're wonderful. But there's also moments that are pokey and uncomfortable, but they're designed to make you soar. They're designed to teach you how to fly in your faith. And God wants, God allows things beca because he allows that restlessness because he wants us to grow. He wants us to grow up. And, and there's a certain stage in our life where comfort actually serves a purpose in our growth. It helps us grow. Like if you just throw the baby eaglet in a pokey nest, it'll probably kill the baby, baby eaglet. But there's a, there is a point where that, that baby eagle will die if it stays in the nest. Second question, is God trying to change my perspective? See, the eaglet's worldview is limited to the edge of the nest when it's born. It looks up and it sees its boundaries, but it doesn't see the rest of the world. And part of the purpose of removing that comfort that that mother eagle removes it is so that that baby will see there is a whole world you can soar over outside of what you've known as, your, as comfort. There's a whole world for you to experience and to grow and thrive in. 
You see, the purpose of an eagle is not to sit comfortably in its nest. It's to soar. And in our faith, there's a point where our focus, it actually needs to change for us to keep growing. There's, a, there's, a, there's points, I would say there's multiple points in our journey of faith where our perspective has to enlarge to keep growing. We need to see things from a different point of view. And so often discomfort is going to be the vehicle that will take us to seeing. So the, the good question is, what are perspectives that I have held in the past that are now holding me? What are perspectives that I've held in the past that are now holding me? Another great question, is my desire for comfort sabotaging my need for growth? Is my desire for comfort sabotaging my need for growth? When we see, when we see a six-week-old nursing, it's good. But when we see a 16-year-old nursing, we think something may have gone wrong. And this is kind of what Paul wrote. He wrote to the church, you should be eating meat and solid food. But instead, I have to keep feeding you milk. And you can almost hear the insult in here. You know, you should be capable of preparing your own meals at this point in your faith. You should be capable of sustaining your own faith. Instead, you still have to suckle at my teat. <laughs> I like that phrase. <laughs> there comes a point. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> you know, there comes a point. Our spiritual diet is no different. Infants, and eat, I'm reading a book right now. It's a great book. If you actually want to read a book that's all on health and nutrition and the body and its systems, it's a, it's a book. It's called Metabolical, and it's a, it's a very good book. It's not a spiritual book at all. But it has metaphors are all over the place. But this is what it makes a statement in this book on infants and eating, and it's this to develop a taste for healthy, savory foods, you have to introduce food to an infant an average of 13 times before they will accept it. To get an infant to develop a taste for sugar, guess how many times you have to introduce it? One time. And it triggers the same system in your brain that heroin triggers. It triggers the opioid system in your brain. It's as addictive as opium. It's as addictive as cocaine. One time. 13. That's why we just lose heart with our children trying to get them to eat healthy, don't we? Because it's, it's like 13 times is a lot of work. Where one time, give them the sugar one time. That's why, that's why processed food adds sugar to everything. Okay, don't get me started. Our spiritual diet's no different. Our spiritual lives are no different. Developing a taste for that which is healthy spiritually, that which will develop you spiritually, you have to introduce it to your diet, and you have to keep introducing it to your diet over and over and over, and it 13 times. Maybe pick a luckier number, 14 times. You have to continue to put that into your life, and your taste doesn't develop right away. But mental junk food? One time. And all of a sudden, and have you ever noticed that when you start eating healthy, you start developing a taste for healthy food? But you only have to eat unhealthy once, and you're not craving the healthy food for the next couple of days. You keep craving the junk. And, I, you know, in our, in, our, in our spiritual lives, it works the same way. We, we, crave, we crave what we feed ourselves with continually when it's healthy, but we start craving that which is unhealthy very, very quickly. And that's why... I'll oh, just keep going, Mike. <clears throat> Move on. Yeah, what... 
So when it comes to restlessness of our spirit, restlessness of our heart, well, here's a great question. What am I feeding on? Have I been feeding on mental junk food? Have I been filling, am I filling my life with, with things that aren't filling my soul? And then wondering why I'm not craving things for my soul that are healthy. Okay. Next point. Great question, Mike. Here's another question when it comes to restlessness is what areas of my life need to be strengthened? What areas of my life need to be strengthened? Does my faith need strengthening? My spirit? Does my emotional or my relationships need strengthening? What, what are the parts of my life that are causing me to long for comfort or that are causing me to long for the comfort of the nest? That, that's causing me to get restless with the situations that I'm in. See, our physical frames don't become restless through overuse. They actually become restless through underuse. If you want to be rested, the best way to be rested is be active. If you get inactive, and you, we've all done this, where you sit around, you just, I'm just going to take a day off, and then you just sit around the house all day, and then by 6 o'clock, you're going nuts. And it's like, I am not relaxed. I want to go do something. I need to run a marathon. Or I need to, like, you just, it, resting, just resting actually doesn't rest you. Being active rests you. And there's, there's areas in our lives, there's, um, sorry, I got lost in my notes. <clears throat> when, where we're feeling restless is actually showing us where we're not active. And so it's, it's getting active in those areas. It's, and, and by getting active in those areas, we strengthen ourselves in those areas. And so the, uh, in our, this season, I, I guess this season has taught me a lot about the effects of stress on the body. How many of you have felt a little stressed out in the last 16 to 17 months? It's just like, it's like I got a subscription card to stress. And I've noticed that, I've noticed when I get stressed, I want to check out. I want to disengage. Like, I want to just, I just don't want to think about things. I want to eat crappy food. I want to watch TV. I want to just, I want to do things that don't require thought. But what I've noticed is this actually doesn't help the situation. The uh, checking out doesn't solve the problem. Problems get solved when we actually get engaged. Problems in, and, and there's, there's things in our lives we're facing, they get, they get resolved because we actually get engaged in solving those problems. Because we, we engage in life, we engage in, in the problem. We, sometimes it's we engage in learning. And the thing is about engaging, it takes work to engage. It, it takes effort. But that it's, it's, like, it's like the same rest you feel after physical exertion when you start engaging the situations you're facing, you start to get relief from stress. You start to get relief from that problem. Sitting, just sitting and thinking about stressful situations, it's not a good idea, is it? Because nothing gets resolved until we get engaged, until we get active. All right, I got to keep moving here because I'm taking too long. You know, there's, um, there's a great, great book that just, just came out, Christine Kane, and uh, many of you would know her. She just, she just wrote a book called How Did I Get Here? And uh, I would recommend that you get it because it asks some great questions. She tell, I, I can't tell this. I think Monica talked about it last week briefly, too. And uh, somewhere, anyways, great book. How did I get here? And she makes this great statement in there about, about how we need to pay close attention to our lives be, because, because we're prone to drift. And when we're restless, that's, that's a particularly a time that we have to pay close attention to our lives because we're, we're prone to drift. Her Hebrews 2.1, it says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. 
And you know, restlessness is one of those things that can cause us to start drifting. It can start causing us to drift from, from uh, it, it can cause us to drift into places that aren't good for us. Places that aren't healthy for, uh, whether it's our emotional lives, whether it's our spiritual lives, or whether it's our relationships. That restlessness can take us to places we don't want to be. And uh, in this season, a great question to ask ourselves is, have I, have I quit paying close attention to that which is in my life? Have I, am, I, am I paying attention or am I allowing myself to drift? So I want to, there's help for the restless mind. There's help for the restless mind. And we've all had a lot of time over the last 15, 16 months to rehearse and repeat our stresses and experiences. And in some case, our lack of experiences or lack of connections or, you know, there's just been a lot. I've no, we've had a lot of time to think and stew about things, but we haven't had all that much opportunity to do things about them. A lot of us, like we've missed things, but we sit at home and think about them by ourselves that, boy, I miss relationships. And then here we are 16 months later. And the restlessness of mind has set in. And one of the things that we have to, we have to understand about our restless mind is not all thoughts are equal. Not all thoughts are equal, nor should we give nor should we give equal weight to everything that we think. We need to learn to think better when it comes to stress. We need to learn to think in healthy ways that allows stress, that teach us how to let stress pass over us, or how to let that restlessness of mind pass over us. And we need to, to get good at creating moments in our life that are not charged with emotion, or not charged with the restlessness, or not charged with disappointment, and learn to process life, especially in, the, in these times of reflection and stewing, allow, allow them to pass over us without triggering emotional responses in us. Now there's this great, uh, a book in uh, his book, Get Your Life Back by John Eldridge, he says this, he calls these, he calls them grace moments. And he, he says it's creating these situations are creating sensations that say there's no emergency helps calm the body's alert system, which we have all had our body alert system pretty much on overdrive for the last year and a half. And what that does is it allows our brain or our prefrontal cortex to regain its ability to think and to plan again. It's creating these calm states in our lives. It's allowing yourself to experience the uncomfortable emotion without feeding them and making them more intense and thus you allow that emotion to pass over. He talks specifically about self-medication and he, he says this, you know, soothing yourself and this would be whether it's through substances or through, you know, just entertainment or just mindless, you know, things that just you can turn off. Soothing yourself will help you tolerate in the short run, but in the long run, it doesn't actually help you solve the situation. So what's, he, he says here, what are some helpful ways to experience these grace moments? One is ex get generous amounts of sunshine, get, get surrounded by things that are living and green, eat real food, take long walks, exercise, appreciate beauty, music, drink water, simple physical labor, or to have a hobby that you love. These are ways of just helping to create these moments where you can, you can healthy, pro, healthily process what you're going through, the restlessness. What's unhelpful? Grocery stores, malls, television, traffic, numbing out, escapism, processed and junk food, draining and unhealthy people, the news, politics, and social media. <laughs> what does not help? Uh, 
Oh, and here's help for the restless heart. What, what is our, see, your heart is restless because it's trying to tell you something. Our hearts get restless because, see, I think when, I think depression is actually a sign that our soul is trying to get our attention. And I think sometimes we are too quick to jump onto the <clears throat> let's numb it out train when we, we should be asking is the why is it there? Like, why is my soul trying to get my attention? And I don't want to oversimplify. Depression is a complicated subject. And there's, there's, there's a message for another day. But I do believe our soul tries to get our attention. Our restless heart tries to get our attention because it's wanting to lead us to a new place. It's wanting... If I'm finding myself depressed, I have to ask the question, what is it trying to tell me? Maybe, I think a lot of times it's trying to tell us where our hope is planted. Is my hope in Jesus? Or is my hope in a certain outcome? Is my hope anchored in Christ? Or is my hope, you know, is it kind of anchored in circumstance? That if things are good, I'll believe God loves me. But if things are hard, well... This nest is uncomfortable. The mother must not care anymore. No, maybe the mother has a better place for us to go. I got too many notes today. Let's stand up. I just want to, I want to encourage us. You know, this restlessness is actually a good thing if it leads us to a good place if it if it allows us if we if we respond to it in a healthy way it can take us to a place where we can experience not just life good but actually life as god intended for us to experience it and so i want us to just pray if you wherever you're at if you're watching online right now you can just close your eyes where you're at and just in this room if you want to just put your hand on your heart and say lord would you teach me what you're trying to teach me through restlessness would you open the eyes of my heart to see where you're leading me and give me understanding of what this season is meant to develop in my life, in my family, in my friendships, and in my church. Thank you, Father. Father, I just pray for everyone that's here and watching right now that that we we would not view the restlessness as an enemy, but to realize that that restlessness is something that you put in us to grow, to cause us to to get to the edge of the nest where the places in life where we have been comfortable so that we can see there's a much broader world, there's a much broader perspective that you want us to have. And that as we as we process the restlessness, that we would allow you to speak to us through it. That you would we would allow you to lead us, even if it's through the discomfort and the pokey sticks that we would allow you to lead us forward in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I'm going to pray one more prayer, and it's a prayer. Maybe you're here, and you've never actually said yes to Jesus or said yes to a relationship with him or following his purpose. I'm going to lead us uh, in a prayer right now, and you can just pray wherever you're at. You can just pray with us. We're going to pray this as a church, and you can just pray with us as we pray. Jesus, I want to follow you. I say yes to you, to your plan and your purpose for my life. I want to know what you have for me and follow it in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc slash next step or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor to play a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to connecting with you soon.